Oh, that's what it looks like when you press that button. Indeed. So today I'm absolutely thrilled to be talking to the founder of Automated Creative, an agency that turns brands' media impressions into marketing intelligence. His impressive client list includes the likes of Diageo, Fevertree, Adidas, GSK, Samsung, KFC, and many, many more. Um, Tom is the host of the Advertisers Watching Ads, where each week brands watch and discuss other brands' ads, and it's fantastic if you haven't already checked it out. He's also the host of the Shiny New Object podcast, which explores the future of marketing and industry leaders, where he recently interviewed Sir Martin Sorrell. And that's actually where I came across Tom initially. He did a phenomenal interview, and that's why I've invited him to the show. So Tom, massive warm welcome. Hey, it's brilliant to be on someone else's podcast. Thank you so much. Listen, can you start off by just spending a few minutes talking about you, your background, and maybe how you help your clients at Automated Creative? Yeah, sure. So I sort of have a long history of failing at a lot of things. I, I left university early to go and be a rock star, moved out of London when I was 19. And a few years later, I made a terrible album that didn't do very well. And then I was a chef for a couple of years and with a, uh, and then did about 200 gigs as a stand-up comedian. And I just wasn't very good at any of those things really, but in the process I discovered advertising and also discovered that you could work in a creative industry and get paid, which had sort of evaded me up to that point. Um, and so I worked in a design agency, a digital agency and a social media agency uh, where I was, it was at We Are Social, I was the innovation director, and I fell in love with the way that automation was being used to do creative things. So the, the automation of copy, music, like poems, media campaigns, researching audiences. And I just thought, wow, like at, at some point, all of these creative skills are going to come together and there's going to be this kind of whole new creative service uh, that, that has got automation at the center of it. So I thought, well, look, I'm going to go and try and make that thing. And four years later, almost, almost to the day yeah we're working with the clients you mentioned you know we picked up in the last quarter png to known mondelez cancer research uk and, and, and a few more and and as you say yeah we turn impressions into intelligence so we essentially take what people are saying in social about a brand or a category we listen to the conversations of, of real people what are they saying and then we turn all of those conversations into hundreds and sometimes thousands of ads and based on what people click on or interact with we can infer what are the psychological triggers that are driving the kind of action that the brand wants so instead of the creative team or the the brand team making some assumptions about the audience we're just listening to the audience then we're making hundreds of ads that re respond to all of those conversations showing those ads to the same people that had them pretty much and then looking at the data in a very analytical way about what's working from a visual and written perspective so we deliver two things we deliver incredible leaps in advertising performance but also we deliver deep consumer insight that you you probably couldn't get anywhere else it's so impressive. I mean, I've got so many questions I'd love to um, unpack, but I mean, is this, I mean, are you the only agency doing this? Because this is, this for me feels very forward thinking. Is, is this unique? And you've been doing it for four years now. Have you found that other agencies have kind of jumped on this? So I spend a lot of time making sure that we're the odd one out so that we have competitors who have raised like tens of millions of pounds. And so what we can't compete on a sort of cash perspective in that sense, but we thrive on the, the principle of just being different and being daring. So we're constantly looking, right, how can we be different? How can we outmaneuver? How can we out strategize the competition and add value to the client in a way that they're not getting somewhere else? So there are lots of technologies that make dynamic ads i guess would be the closest thing the majority of the industry in this sort of the dynamic ad space um it's a bit moronic it's a bit dumb it's a it's a bit like you get these 100 copy lines and these 100 images and they just sort of churn through them in a mechanical way which which is fine which serves a purpose but it won't tell you why your ads work 
Whereas what we do is much more empathetic, listening to the audience, understanding what they're saying, then creating the ads that reflect the wants, needs, and desires of the audience, and then get the validation from the same audience about what is working. And so we're blending some of those agency softer skills of uh, uh, strategic thought and creativity and copywriting with the mechanical, with the automation. So I, to, to deliver a service, which I believe is unique, but of course, there's other people that do different elements of what we do. Okay, so it actually sounds very, very comprehensive. So in order to kind of bring this to life for the audience, could you give me an example, maybe or, or one or two examples of campaigns that you've run? Um, because I'm interested to see, you know, from start to finish how that works and also maybe the metrics behind the results that you've had. Yeah, so uh, one of our long-term clients is Reckitt or Reckitt Bankiza as they were, they were known recently. And we work out of... Uh, Singapore and serve um, APAC, those guys, as well as actually North America, Canada, and kind of all over the place for those guys now. But the first project we did sort of ran, I think, like 18 months um, across seven different markets. And what we're trying to do is decode what were the written and visual triggers that drove a performance for the brand Enfamil, which is an infant formula. Uh, so less well known here in the UK, but massive in China, massive in, massive in the US. And um, it was really great to see our client go on stage and, and talk about the work relatively recently. And, you know, she said that when we were working in one of the markets, uh, we were able to prove with our technology that the best thing that you could put in an ad targeted at a mom was in fact a dad. And because we tested so many different things, we were able just to hone down on what, what were the visual triggers that, that drove performance. And then that led to that sort of awareness and, um, CRM driving campaign moved on to a conversion campaign and we took the learnings, we took the insight that our tool had developed and we were able to half the cost of sale of their baby milk product from ads on Facebook, which is just absolutely ginormous for a, a brand of, of that size. But that's the thing we're really passionate about is delivering those kind of performance figures, but delivering that kind of insight that dad was more powerful than say a mom and a child. It's, it's just so fascinating to me because I think that one of the downsides of the industry is people talk about best practice a lot. They talk about, oh, well, if you look at best practice, this brand does this, so we should copy that because that's what best practice is. That's what they call it at school. They call it copying. So if everyone's copying each other, then no one's marketing because marketing is the practice of standing out from the market. So what our technology does is able to help brands identify the things that uh, make them stand out from the market. So another example would be for, for KFC, a retained client where we are constantly uh, driving the performance of, of their paid campaigns and social. And actually our client was on stage at Madfest talking about the work and, and he was reporting back how we kind of change the tone of voice of the ads, um, whether it's kind of straight or humorous or sarcastic, um, and it'll just change from week to week. So once again, with KFC, we do that by listening to the audience. How are people talking about takeaway food? I mean, people say all kinds of crazy things like, uh, oh, I've been to the gym, so therefore I deserve a burger. So cool, we'll put that in an ad and see if it works. Um, and this is ongoing work um, for KFC. So we've just won sort of best brand brand in the UK, I think last year, um, and we've delivered a 40% reduction in cost per download of their app, which is just a, a, a astonishing results. So yeah, so that that's what we do. And I've got probably 100 of those stories with, with similar insights and uh, similar levels of performance. Wow. Well, congratulations on that. And I did actually see that interview on Madfest with the, uh, I, think, I don't know if it's brand manager for KFC. CMO now, Jack. He, a CMO. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Um, but that's a fantastic story. Maybe we'll include the link in the show notes, actually, because that's a great case study. Um, I'm curious to know how this kind of AI powered technology actually works. I mean, when you talk about multiple variations of the copy and multiple variations of the, the you know, the, the visual, um, which then kind of accelerates the learning and the insight and leveraging what's working to make it even more optimized how does that actually come together like what's the input that you have can you just maybe just keep it simple for me but just how does that work yeah so the, the original vision for the business was just to automate everything we'd like press a button and a campaign would appear and the sales would happen and you know we just sit around on the beach somewhere but that hasn't <laughs> happened at all um and the reality is is that 
machines are really good at some things and they're really good at doing lots of small things very quickly whereas humans are good at strategic tangential thinking that kind of happens slowly over time and when you get machines to try and do that stuff it's awful and then equally trying to get a human to do lots of things very quickly uh, that takes a long time and is, is very expensive so essentially our technology which has ai elements throughout the process is, is fundamentally focused on automation hence the name and uh, and what it really does is is able to produce ads very quickly which is obviously very useful because it means you don't have to choose one ad you don't have to make a bet uh, so brands can now test hundreds if not thousands of things if they if they desire um, so the technology makes the ads very quickly but our technology also knows what is going on at every stage of every ad so when these these ads are out in in the wild and people are reacting to them watching videos clicking on links buying something we we know what was going on at each stage of each ad so at a, at a at an audience level we can understand the written and visual triggers that drive performance then we can make more ads based on what we know is what's working and turn off the stuff that isn't so you're going through an iterative process of creative sprints we call them to really understand what is driving interest in this brand so at the end of the campaign performance is amazing but actually you have these really juicy gooey psychological insights into why this brand is appealing to the audience that they're speaking to this might sound like a dumb question, but presumably to the starting point is you coming up with the idea and you coming up with the messaging and then you're putting it out and then iterating from there. Like how many versions do you have to kind of put out there? Am I, am I getting it right? Um, yeah, it's pretty close. So typically what happens is we will work downstream of a creative agency. So a brand will have a creative agency. They'll have a, a big creative idea and they'll have like a TV ad or, a, you know, thousands of, gifts or statics or whatever it is and then we work out strategically what the brand is trying to achieve mm -hmm. um, and then based on that strategy we will generate all of the variants we need to deliver that job so it's it's not a case of like how many it's a case of what is what does the brand want are they trying to drive sales are they trying to drive awareness do they want to get people to watch their video do they want people to go to the website and you know stick around for a bit so it depends on what the actual goal is but we combine what they want to achieve with, with with what they have with the insight from the social listening or search keyword analysis so it is a bit of a depends answer so i apologize but no uh, thank you for explaining that got it got it so does, does that mean then that you work alongside sometimes agencies rather than you know clients bringing you in to work alongside their agencies do you do yeah. you ever yeah so so we sit in a very uncomfortable place which is we're a tech platform but we do a lot of things that you would expect from an agency so obviously we're all ex-agency ourselves and um, so we sit between the the creative discipline the creative agency and the media agency so we create a fluid relationship between those things so instead of the creative agency producing a thing giving it to the creative agency and then them running with it uh, what we do is we we put an, uh, a kind of catalyst in the middle and an extra step that explodes the effectiveness of the the ads but also delivers the insight so yes we we have to sit alongside um, other partners so kfc for example it's a um, mother of the lead creative agency and mind share of the lead creative agency uh, sorry media agency so we uh yeah we we play nicely with those guys got it thank you so much this is all becoming a little bit clearer for me now that's that's really useful thank you i'm interested i've watched a few of your episodes of the advertisers watching ads and i love it for a lot a lot of reasons a you get some fantastic um high quality great um, guests on there but also that they're only 10 minutes long so i'm just interested why did you start both the shiny new object podcast and the advertisers watching ads show <laughs> So the podcast was started when I started the business pretty much because I was at We Are Social and they'd essentially built a massive successful agency off the back of obviously delivering the work, but they had a blog called the Monday Mashup, which was just probably still exists, which is just the kind of list of everything that's happened in social that week. And it was really granular, like really nerdy. And the whole industry would just converge on that blog every Monday and it just developed this trust for the for those guys and i just thought right well when i set up my business i need my own media platform um and i thought uh, as we were discussing before like I'm, I'm not a great reader not a great writer but i, I can talk a bit uh, so i thought well i love, love listening to podcasts so why not make a podcast so uh 
I thought, well, I'm running this business. I'm, you know, I'm the account manager, the salesperson. That I'm so wearing so many hats that you can't go to conferences, you can't sit around reading blogs. You've got to make bank. You know, you have to make this business make money from day one. And so, doing the podcast meant I could network. I could make sure my business was relevant. I could learn and I could create content. So just doing an hour long podcast, which is now sort of 20 minutes, but started off as an hour long podcast. If I did that every week, interviewing the most interesting people I knew in in London, then it would kind of tick all of those boxes. And I think 160, 65, 165 episodes later, I've interviewed some just amazing people. Um, And yes, we finally took pity on Martin Sorrell and got him on the podcast the other day. He's a nice guy, actually. Um, but, you know, I I reached out to the global VP of uh, marketing for Lenovo. And I said, do you want me on the podcast? He's like, yeah, sure. And so now I have like all of these people I've got this lovely relationship with because I've spent time with them, talked to them and understood like where they're coming from, what their vision for the industry is. So so that's what the Shiny New Object podcast is. And it's, it's a real labor of love. It's brilliant. And then advertisers watching ads was our kind of lockdown project and everything slowed down as it did for everyone. Um, and there were all these awful things on LinkedIn, like here's nine ways to have a great Zoom call. And we're just like, no, that is not <laughs> us. And then I, I saw Gogglebox, which for anyone who doesn't know, is a TV show where you watch people watching TV, but don't actually see what they're watching. Um, loosely it. And I thought, well, what if we did that for advertising? You know, everyone's got an opinion on everyone else's ad, so why not record that? So I get three, three or four brands every week to review an ad. We're partnered with Contagious. So Contagious go and source these weird and wonderful ads, uh, do a LinkedIn poll every week, and people can vote on which ad to go on the show. And then we have like just brilliant guests. And we don't know what, we don't know what the brief was. We don't know what the budget is. We don't know the context. But nonetheless, we all have a stab at trying to work out what was going on. And I think we just did our 65th episode of that. Um, and I love it. Brilliant. And you get to network and learn and be inspired by a real range of different people. The other week we had, I think, someone in London, Singapore, New York, all on all on a call, all discussing an ad from uh, somewhere else in the world. So I, it, what a treat that it, my job allows me to do that stuff as well. And, and what high quality content. I mean, it's they're, they're brilliant, I have to say. I mean, there's probably agency leaders listening thinking, that's a really good idea. Maybe I should go down the podcast route. How beneficial has it been to your business? Oh, transformative, right? Like it's, it's, uh, it's done all the things that it was supposed to do, right? So we're creating content, which drives traffic and interest. It's opened doors to start new conversations. It's helped me learn and stay on top of things. Um, and it's always it's always kind of different. It's all you're meeting people from different backgrounds and learning about their their lives up to the point of which you recorded the podcast. And you and with the shiny new object podcast, people always talk about their shiny new object. So that might be technology or it might be like a mindset thing. So yeah, um I, had, I think it's Riley Dunn from Unilever was taught his shiny shiny new object was extended parental leave. And I was like, what? what? Okay, cool. Tell me about that. And he said, well, you know, if there's longer um, uh, parental leave for dads, then, you know, they'll be closer to their families, make them all rounded persons. Therefore they will do better marketing. Or I interviewed David Byrne from Aviva and he was talking about NFTs. And so both of those things that not necessarily know a great deal about, but you get to dive into these topics and, and really learn. So it's, it's making me a more rounded, knowledgeable, and hopefully more interesting person for you know, spending time with these people, but it, it's been great. So it's really good, good for their profiles. It's good for my profile. It's good for the business's profile. And, and hopefully the agency can learn from these experts sharing some of their vision. Absolutely agree. And even, you know, you get the insight behind the client, don't you? I mean, from a account management point of view, everyone's trying to understand the clients better, you know, how they think what's important to them. But and actually, there's a lot of um, insight that you're generating from how they think, you know, how they use language, what's important to them. So it's even more, you know, clever than I originally thought. Um, what, you mentioned that you learn a lot. What, what have been the kind of the standout things that you've learned through doing those 165 episodes? I think that the main thing that I've got is that adversity builds rapport. So it's made me look back on my life and my friendships in and outside of work. And my mini theory is, and you can challenge me on this as much as you like, but is that you form the best friendships through adversity. So whether you've got like an awful job and you just sort of, you're surviving it with someone or you've got a terrible teacher or a 
boring commute or a, a difficult boss or work on a different a difficult project or if you've like ever done creative stuff so you've been if you've ever been in a band or in a theatrical production but if you put yourself in a position of risk and adversity and, and almost discomfort then you naturally you're looking for comfort at the same time so therefore you f you form bonds with people uh, a, a lot quicker so if i said uh, to someone oh, do you want do you want to come on my podcast it probably they haven't done one before so they're in they're in a position of like elevated stress and even if they're confident about doing it they'll still be like feeling they're on stage and then i hopefully give them a positive experience and guide them through that and or you know allow them to shine in the, their best way possible and it and it just means that you get to know people because you sort of go through that adversity together it just means that you have a rapport afterwards so like of those 160 odd people that I've interviewed, I, if I saw them at a conference, I could go across and I'd say, hey, do you remember doing that podcast? I know we've never actually met in person, but I really enjoyed that. We were talking about X, Y, Z. And like, oh. So th there's no way that that rapport isn't just instantly there. So uh, that's the thing that I've, I've really learned that d doing creative stuff where people are slightly exposed, you're like, you can form a, a deeper, uh, a better rapport, stronger relationship by doing that. Um, another thing would be that I've sort of turned into an unpaid part-time recruiter. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, I can't. So, well, um, you know, you, because you built this rapport. Oh, do you, you know anyone? Connection. Yeah, it's like, oh, I'm sick of working at this company. Um, I don't know, well, what do you want to do? Oh, well, I've always wanted to work in automotive or FMCG. Well, look, I've, I've interviewed 15 of these guys. Do, do any of these people seem interesting to you? And so... Um, and I've, you know, I've helped clients get jobs and start conversations. And because if, if, you, if someone's been on a podcast and someone else has been on the same podcast, you go, Hey guys, you've got this thing in common. And you know, it's, I can't, I'm, I'm not selling that person myself. I'm just going, you should, you should talk. And then that allows that, that thing to happen. And when that, I just love that. It's just such a cherry on the cake to, to put two interesting people together and have them be like, you know, to connect and get on with each other. Um, and yeah. And the, yeah, the other thing is just, you know, uh, it, it does open doors like the, I've I've met people from all over the world that I now have this this the beginnings of an, an interesting and hopefully sort of lifelong relationship with because we've done this creative thing together because we've made a podcast um so yeah those are the three things yeah building rapport sort of being a recruiter and opening doors it's so powerful I mean anyone listening to this is thinking wow I mean I can't believe that I actually can't believe that more agencies don't do podcasts for these reasons. And I hadn't really thought about the adversity angle, but you're absolutely right. You know, and I think maybe that's why coming from an agency background, you know, where there is that constant pressure and everybody's under stress and maybe pitching behind the scenes, it bonds you, doesn't it? And you form, I mean, I'm still in contact with people that I work with, you know, 25 years ago because of those intense periods, yeah. <laughs> you know? So I, I think this is really well articulated. Thank you. I really um, can see that that would be the, the case. Um, I want, I'm interested, Tom, in talking about uh, your, the marketing clients you work with and just thinking about, you know, obviously we've, we're coming, are we coming out of the pandemic? Who knows? But, you know, during that period of time where everyone was locked down, um, how have you seen their needs changing from when that happened to now? I think, yeah, I was, I was really, um, I was really, yeah, it, this is the one question you sent over and I was like, oh God, that, that, this could go on a while. But I, I think like um, ultimately the, the changing needs of the clients haven't been so much been defined by the pandemic is more like the type of work that we do with them so where some businesses really struggled during the pandemic we've we've grown like you know quite aggressively um because we have a technology that makes people's ads work a lot better but we also deliver the insight into why uh, and so this has been sort of transformative for our clients as they realize that the old school method of you do some research, you make an assumption based on that research, you write a strategy, and then the, the creative idea gets made based on that strategy, and then that gets produced and then delivered. And that, that was the sort of the process, give or take. Whereas what we do is we we do the research, the social listening bit, and then we produce tons of ads, and then based based on which of those ads work, reinforms new creative. So all of, with all of our clients, we're all teaching them a new skill set anyway. Uh, we are 
We're using technology, we're using automation to make advertising better by doing it in a different way. So, um, so I, I think that agencies are going to have to change because we are creating an expectation from the client that they're going to want speed and scale as well as good ideas. So, um, I think in five years time, 10 years time, the, we will see campaign, all campaigns will work the way that we're doing them. So there will be a great idea that comes from a sort of creative agency, but then there will be this multiple versions that, that iterate, that, that develop over time. It will become a lot more fluid. So I think agencies and brands need to like get educated on exactly how that works because it, we've done nothing else for four years and there's a, there's a process and there's a technology that needs to be understood and, and deployed to do that. I think you're totally right. I mean, like you said, you're changing the expectations of the clients. I mean, you've already talked through the amount of clients you're working with, the blue chip clients, and it's not, their expectations are going to change of other agencies and other agencies are going to think, well, we're going to be left behind if we don't get on board with this. Um, I mean, to that point, how do they do that learning? I mean, obviously, from a client perspective, they can come and work with you. Maybe some clients, I mean, is there any resistance or is this kind of a no brainer offer? Because you're offering, you know, a faster process, a, a more cost effective, I would imagine, um, efficient and more kind of using insight. What, what's the barrier? What's the challenge to them? Uh, the barrier is always apathy, right? Right. So they, to do something new, it's going to take new knowledge, it's going to take more effort. It's, it's so much easier just to just to go and do the, the, the thing that they, they normally do. Um, and with innovation, there's risk. And with innovation, there's effort. Uh, and with innovation, you never know quite what you're going to get until you've done it. Um, so that's the journey we take all of our all of our clients through from from being excited about it to, to getting on board and to eventually our clients using our self-serve tool. So, you know, at any one given time, there's like hundreds of ads being made by people all over the world using this technology and using it in a way to suit their strategic needs of, of the brand. So um, yeah, you can't, you can't read a book on it. Um, you can't just gen up on it over the weekend. You've got to do it. So you, we're breaking the model. We're revolutionizing the way that technology is used to make ads. And ultimately actually that, you know, that has a, a real impact on account management, you know, so we're revolutionizing the way that, that people work within this kind of service, you know, we're not that old agency model of like, just get the juniors in, don't pay them very much and make them work even in some weekends. So we are very much focused on a, like, you know, 40 hours is enough. If you can do your job in 40 hours, that's great. You know, we don't work the evenings, we don't work the weekends. Occasionally those things happen, but it's not the norm. It's not the expectation because, you know, we can create, a thousand ads in like an, an hour but not the always need to do that many but we've we've removed all of the sort of the boring work and the the manual stuff so we, we've automated that so hence why we can do this stuff so quickly so yeah it's um brands agencies they've just got to try and do it because it's it's being defined right now and the the, the revolution of ads at scale and producing performance and insight at the same time is, is it, it's happening right now but then brands and agencies have to get involved in it i'm glad you brought up the topic of account management and their role that they play because i'm sure there are some account managers that maybe this is the first time that they've heard you know what you offer as an agency and they could you know because at the moment there seems to be a real shortage of account managers to go around and they might be drawn by the fact that you are at the cutting edge of what's changing you've got these blue chip clients you're doing something different and they're probably going to be attracted to that to working with you so tell me can you spend a few minutes just talking about your account management philosophy you've talked about 40 hours a week that's enough you know but what other things are important for you um with the account manager role in your agency yeah so it's just basic principles really like uh I loved those jobs I had where I could presume permission, you know, asking forgiveness, not permission. Just like we've hired you because we think you're really smart and we like you. Just go and get on with it. I, I really believe in hiring incredibly intelligent, driven people and pointing them at a problem. And they know they're not going to get it right all of the time, but most of the time they will. Um, but then they need to look after themselves, you know, like, you know, like, if you need to take lunch, take lunch, you know, have, you have to nurture you. And part of that is finding their best place to work. So we've, we, we worked remotely for the first year and a half, and then we worked in an office and then 
the pandemic happened so uh we sort of obviously like everyone were pretty fluid but the the, the thing is like find the best place to do your work you know if you if you've got a like a deep problem to solve then you you know, probably best sat in your pajamas on the couch. Whereas if you just got a bunch of small things to do and you want a bit of chat, then you know, work from the office. And you know, we we're big on like we we just don't want to see a, like a work version of people. We don't want to see a corporate version of someone. We we just you know, we we like the whole person and we just want that person to be themselves and as as, as much as they can and feel comfortable to do that. Um, you know, we're also a big believer in, in family first. Um, you know, I've got a I've got a young daughter who refuses to sleep and creates all kinds of problems, and the and the team are very sympathetic to that. But whether that's a, a partner or a, a family member, you know, like you have to have that core in place. And so we're we're really big on on making sure that family comes first. Um, and yeah, and you know, as I said before, like respecting the weekends, just you need time off but yeah ultimately um it's it's about doing the right thing by each other and and by our clients um and we also have a a spirit of transparency and you know trying to trying to where, where possible just be blunt just be open just be transparent um and and having a not just having a laugh as much as possible but like when that good time's happening like let it happen do you know what i mean it shouldn't be like right now we've got to get back to work and be all serious now so that those are the kind of loose principles that that we we work around but yeah they we've done our best work before automated creative when we had autonomy when we could be entrepreneurial we could take ownership we knew that our bosses trusted us um and yeah, so and so that remains. We want you know we want our staff to affect the process. It's not like here's a deck on how to be an account manager, automated creative. It's like no, you write that deck, you write that process, you tell us what needs to go into the product from a technical perspective. So yeah, so our account team get exposed like incredibly senior clients because we have this really unique seat at the table because of the technology because we're delivering this performance because we're delivering this this insight so hopefully we're revolutionizing advertising but also the way that account management works as well i love that if i was 30 years younger tom i'd be chasing you for a job <laughs> not not that what you do now is uh, kind of would have existed 30 years ago but absolutely i love the fact that you said you know bring your whole self we want to know every aspect of you you're talking about what google has coined psychological safety you know if you make a mistake don't worry it's not going to be you know that kind of uh what's it called um environment where you're going to feel punished um you said that you want you know you choose smart driven people um in order to get those people that can hit the ground running and take over and take that ownership what's your hiring process like like how do you attract new new people well it comes back to what we're talking about at the start having your own publishing platform right you know so we have thousands of people that watch our uh, shows or podcasts or read our stuff so we 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 are well, in a small way or a media owner right so if you're like oh we're hiring for this you know we, we're hiring for uh, junior account folk at the minute so it's like right well i'll just put an advert on the podcast turn on the microphone hey actually if you listen to the most recent podcast think that the ad should be on should be on there i said hey we're looking to hire a, you know, this you know get in touch here's my email address so actually once again going back to the things that you own to to leverage love that i mean yeah You've already, um, have you filled the role? No, no, we haven't actually. Um, so yes, if anyone is listening to, uh, listening to this, like, please get in touch. We, we want to meet those hungry, curious, creative, innovative, divergent thinkers because uh, that's, that's what this business needs. I really hope that you get some responses from this podcast, that's for sure. Uh, I hope you don't mind me saying this, but I looked at your website and I looked at your, you know, hiring an account manager role and I looked through the job spec. And what I loved about it was there was this massive list of benefits of working for the company. But at the end, it said dot, dot, dot. And anything else that you think you would like to suggest that could be beneficial to the role, you know, or to, 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 to you joining us, which I thought was phenomenal. I'd never seen that before. Of course, so I, we're, we're like, a, we're a startup, right? It's not like we've got all, we've got all the answers. It's not like we've run businesses like this before. We're, we're inventing it every day as we go along. So I want to hire people that make me look at it differently and, and go, oh, well, well, obviously we should have this benefit or why don't we do this? Or why don't we work four days a week? Or why don't we have an office here? Like, because like I don't know what I don't know, and that's where the smart, driven, exciting people can come in and help. 
that you're a brilliant leader to work for because that humbleness just comes through in, in droves and your passion for what you do also comes through. And that's that's so important at the at the top of an organization. You know, you set the tone for the whole agency. And I've worked in enough toxic agency environments to know that, you know, you don't have to look very far. You just look at the top of the tree and you'll find the problem. So I, I hope that people listening to this find it inspiring and we'll get in, in contact with you. Um, Tom, is there anything that I haven't asked you that I should have asked you? Because I just can't believe that I've you know, got you on the podcast and you're doing something so innovative. Where do you see the industry going? Can I throw that one at you? Well, hopefully we're, we're leading that, the industry. Uh, like we're, we know that we, we're right that this really odd way of doing advertising where we listen to what people are actually saying about brands, making ads that reflect those wants, needs, and desires, and then showing them the ads back again for them to qualify what works. Like it just makes so much sense to us. And obviously it works. We've won the clients we've won. We've um, had the success that we've had. Um, but yeah, it's not commonplace. So I, I, I don't know how this isn't going to scale. I don't know how this isn't going to become sort of best practice. So that, that's where that we're trying to lead the industry. We're trying to change it. So it's a, it's a better, get better results for clients. And I think also it's much better for the consumer as well, as opposed to being sort of shouted at by brands, like having ads that reflect them, I think is, is super interesting. And actually uh, one of our clients, we've, um, actually of course a few now, I couldn't think of it, but it's what we're doing is using nano influencers to create user generated content. So not like influencers as in, Hey, I'm really influential about this subject. You should, like like this product just what we're actually doing is just getting the the asset from them themselves so they're just good with a smartphone basically so we've got ads that are reflecting the conversations that consumers are having so, and those same ads have got images or videos in them made by the consumers themselves and those ads are also being kind of voted for and, and ratified by their their interaction with them in social which i think is just crazy so weird but so exciting so much better than like a focus group where 20 people say oh yeah i really like these trainers and then someone comes up with an idea saying oh we'll stick an athlete in them and then put a million quid of media behind it we've had enough of that it's time for a change. I love it. And I've been reading a lot about the creative creator economy and Zoe Skaman is very much, she was on the podcast as well, very much at the forefront of what's changing there. So yeah, that's a genius idea. Final question that's just occurred to me and I just don't want it to, I know it's a bit of a boring one, but you do a lot of B2C brands, yeah. direct to consumer. Do you, have you applied your um, methodologies in a B2B context? We haven't got any b2b clients okay do you think that which that's is, a... really annoys me because i was like yeah but you've never done b2b i'm like oh. look but we have a technology we listen to the audience we create ads we use visuals and test messaging and then we look at the data to work out what works which is completely portable across the b2b but um uh, I'm, I'm yet to convince of any any one of that so if anyone's got any b2b clients then uh yeah let's let's talk about what i'm missing you, there, you never you never know listen this has been fantastic tom i'm so grateful that you came on the show well done for all hey, the podcast no, episodes so really enjoyed the chat um how who would you like to hear from and how can people reach you yeah, just reach out to me on LinkedIn. I obviously read every message. I live on LinkedIn. It's embarrassing. Um, yeah, uh, we are, we're looking for hiring a global head of growth. So anyone who's got experience in in growing tech platforms would be great to hear. But yes, um, if you go to our website, which is automatedcreative.net, uh, there's a jobs page, and that, as, as you say, has has the spec there um, and contact details. My email is tom at automatedcreative.net or yeah. get in touch yeah so we're, we're growing that account management team so which is why it's so brilliant to be on this podcast thank you so much what an absolute treat oh, i really hope it's fruitful for you tom and I, you, you attract the right people to you so thank you again it's been amazing my pleasure